tough decisions to course correct, right? And I would say that's honestly, that's probably the most common um, critical failure with CEOs is they're either slow or unwilling to make tough decisions, right? And I think that that is what separates um, good CEOs from bad CEOs. everyone. Welcome to another episode of The Executive. For those joining for the first time, this is a show where we interview some of the best founders, investors, and operators on their life lessons and advice on how to make it at the highest level. In past few episodes, we've really focused on uh, interviewing VCs with an aerospace focus. And today, I'm really excited to have a little bit of a different perspective uh, with our guest today, who's coming from the private equity realm, but still very focused on what's going on in space and the defense industry. So today, we're joined by Jeff Hart, who is a partner at AE Industrial Partners, which is a private equity firm with now five and a half billion dollars of assets under management, and has had has made notable investments and has actually taken companies public such as Redwire and Big Bear uh, AI, as we're, we're going to talk a little bit about today. They they took those companies public through via SPAC, and have made notable investments, including York Space, uh, in the last couple of years. So really excited to dig in on Jeff's thoughts on the space industry as well as how he got involved and what his focus is. Jeff, thanks for joining today and uh, really excited to dig in with you. Thanks, Matt. Really excited to uh, be talking with you today and looking forward to the conversation. Well, let's, uh, we got a lot to talk about. Um, you've done a, quite, a, quite a few notable things in the space industry, taking a couple of companies public as we, you know, as we discussed. Uh, but I do want to talk about, let's start with your background. You went to school at Colorado Mesa, played basketball all four years, and then you were uh, wise enough and crazy enough to, uh, I think, get into to investment banking and become an analyst at RBC. So give us a little background on yourself and kind of how you got into the whole industry. Yeah. So I was, I was born and raised in Phoenix and then, uh, you know, was just uh, obsessed with basketball my whole life. It was a, it was a passion of mine and I uh, was fortunate enough to go, to go play college basketball. It was, it was division two. It was in uh, Grand Junction, as you mentioned. And, you know, that, that consumed a lot of my time. Uh, but when I was in college, I knew I wanted to get <clears throat> into investing. You know, I was a finance major. I was really passionate about it. I was definitely drawn to it. There's a lot of things about it that I that I that I really love. But you know, basketball was was always first and foremost for me. And so, um, you know, I was I was lucky enough. You know, I say lucky enough to break into investment banking, which is generally, you know, generally a very defined path for folks. You know, I think I got into banking two weeks before I graduated college, right? And so um, was just a scrappy kid that, you know, um, you know, was was uh, very persistent, you know, and once I realized what I needed to do to get into investing and more specifically private equity, I knew that investment banking was sort of that first first step for me. And so, um, you know, was very fortunate to, to land at RBC right out of college, right on the heels of uh, my senior season ending. And then, um, you know, did, did, did two years there and went right back into recruiting for, for private equity, which ultimately took me to AE, where I was actually uh, the first associate uh, at AE back when we, were, when we launched our first fund back in uh, 2014. So it was a bit of an unconventional path for me to get into private equity. Usually it's a very, you know, usually you do an internship or junior year, you get an offer into banking a year out. You know, you do your two years of banking, right? And so, it's, for me, being a being an athlete, took a little bit of a different path. Um, you know, but again, it was it, it all worked out for me. But but ultimately, um, you know, I've been with AE almost ten years now. Wow, how did you make the switch over from RBC? Because I think at RBC you were focused on a lot of oil and gas, um, and then what led you into AE and focusing on on space and defense? <laughs> yeah, it's a good question. I mean, you know. I went to RBC and I got placed in the oil and gas group, you know, at the time beggars couldn't be choosers, right? I, I was very fortunate <laughs> yeah. that a, uh, a spot opened up at all. I mean, they had already closed out their recruiting for their analysts over a year prior to me even joining. And, and just, I was calling them every single week, seeing if there's any openings again, just, just being scrappy at the time. And so when an opening came right place, right time was prepared, got it, you know, and then, um, really enjoyed my time in, in, in the energy group is a fascinating industry, you know, but, but, 
you know, for, wasn't the right long-term industry for me. And so when I met the folks at AE down here in South Florida, you know, they largely had a, a heritage in aerospace. The founders actually came from industry. It wasn't your traditional private equity firm. It was a brand, it was a brand new firm. So an opportunity to really grow with, you know, with, with, with these guys and, you know, jumped all over it. And when I started, you know, we had a lot of, a lot of folks that had a lot of really good aerospace backgrounds coming out of commercial aviation, business aviation. Um, and I saw this opportunity to really step in and help be a thought leader in how they approach national security. And so it was a bit of a greenfield um, opportunity for me and, and my partner, Kirk. And, um, you know, we decided we weren't going to be any good to the firm, trying to be another expert in MRO. Uh, we had folks that had ran engine shops, came from GE, Boeing, what have you, you know. And so we decided to go, you know, tr- you know take on this new challenge that we thought was, was going to help the firm succeed longer term. So what were you initially focused on? I mean, you're obviously the first associate. How are you looking to add value at that point? Yeah, it was funny. You know, when I started, I thought I had to be another aero, another commercial aero guy like everybody else in the firm. Right. And then I, I quickly realized that, you know, there was folks that had 10, 20 years of, of, of experience in that, you know, working for, you know, big industry players. And I, and I realized I wasn't going to be any help to the firm trying to be trying to be another aerospace person. And so I, you know, wanting to kind of blaze my own path, you know, I felt like I was going to be more valuable to the firm if I could own own a different sub vertical that was still adjacent and still had a lot of synergies to sort of what they were doing at the time. Um, and that's what ultimately led me into sort of the defense and government markets, which kind of evolved over time right now. I think we call it, it used to be called defense and government services. You know, now like defense tech is kind of a new term for the industry. You have national security tech, you know, space kind of falls under that. And so it's, it's the markets evolved a lot since we started, but you know, the transition really happened just trying to add value to the firm and, and find us some new swim lanes that, that, you know, longer term, we could, we could build a practice around. Was that pretty hard to convince them early on that you should go focus on a little bit different of a sector than their folks, especially as the first associate, you're already trying to convince them to go into something else. Yeah, it actually, it was funny. It started, we have, we have a portfolio company called Belkian, which was an aerospace engineering company. And our first foray, foray into defense was um, incubating a um, government services division within that platform. And so our first couple of deals in that market were smaller deals, you know, not as much, you know, exposure, you know, from in terms of like how much capital we we're allocating to it, you know, a little bit, you know, kind of on the, on the more on the value side of the equation in terms of the prices that we were paying. So we kind of, it definitely was a, was a, was a crawl walk run approach for us. So it's not like we came out of the gates, guns blazing, you know, paying a billion dollars for, you know, a a big defense asset. We, we started small, you know, we cut our teeth, you know, dealing with some, you know, some hairier situations on smaller deals. And I think we ultimately learned more that way, but um, you know, that was, that was how we started. And then over time just kept building on that practice, kept adding people, kept finding more and more success and, you know, it ultimately worked out for us. Well, be- before we go too much into what, where your main focus is, if you wouldn't mind just giving a quick overview on, you know, AE as a firm, you know, you're, you're a private equity firm, but you also have a venture capital arm to it. Kind of give us a, a high level overview of the, the firm as a whole. Yeah. So again, it, you know, the firm has a really interesting background, right? It, it, it actually was a family office, a small family office for about, um, 13, 14 years, you know, in the late nineties, um, a father son team, Brian and David Rowe, Brian Rowe was the longtime CEO of GE aircraft engines. His son, David, um, you know, worked in the industry as well, ran, you know, GE's, uh, aircraft leasing business, you know, worked at Gulfstream before they went public. Um, and really what happened was, is, 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 um, you know, they, they both retired respectively, Brian, you know, GE Aviation Hall of Fame is named after him. He was just sort of a sort of a legend in the commercial aerospace industry. But, you know, they retired, you know, and started this family office it's called Aero Equity at the time, which is what the AE and AE Industrial Partners stands for. It was really our, our predecessor firm, so to speak. Um, you know, and for, for, again, a little over a decade, they were partnering with very well-known investment firms um, where they were using their industry knowledge, their network, you know, and helping these investment firms, you know, like Carlisle's of the world, go and, and, and buy these companies and execute on these strategies. And they were almost like the sub, the, you know, they were almost like the subject matter experts, right? And they did that very successfully. 
Um, and they would always kick in a little bit of kind of family capital. They did that very successfully until about circa 2013. You know, Dave Rowe, uh, who leads the firm now as, as the founder, you know, saw a huge opportunity in, in the middle market to go and establish, um, you know, a very focused aerospace and defense you know, private equity firm, right, that has roots in the industry, very operationally and strategically focused. And so that's when um, that's when AE kicked off. Right. And that's when I joined shortly after that. And, um, you know, we were based down in South Florida, you know, have a little bit of different flavor than some other private equity firms in terms of how we like to operate. Very relationship oriented. We love founder family owned transactions, um, you know, and we like to do business with people that we like, right? We have a no a-hole policy. We only, we only work with people we like. And, um, you know, that was always kind of the core, the core values of the firm. And, you know, today we're getting ready to close our third fund. You know, we manage about 6 billion in capital. You know, we've, we've, um, you know, basically partnered and taken over managing what was Boeing's venture arm. It's called Horizon X. Now it's AE Horizon X. And so we're unique in that we, we go super, super deep and sort of our, our very, you know, a few amount of the sub verticals uh, that we focus on, but we, from, you know, seed all the way to, you know, dealing with public companies and everything in between, whether that's control, minority, you know, aircraft leasing, you know, we kind of have a, a, a variety of different products that we can use to, you know, what we call build an ecosystem around all the critical technologies, you know, customers and areas within, you know, the broader aerospace and defense landscape, we feel like gives us a really differentiated perspective on what's going on, you know, we love connecting the dots for, our, for all our various companies. We have, I think today, 27 control oriented, kind of like more your typical, you know, private equity platforms. We have another 40 on the venture side. And so we just have this huge ecosystem, all kind of playing in similar spaces, right? That, that allows us to really um, help folks, you know, drive value in a number of different ways, whether that's, you know, access into, you know, maybe specific government agencies or, or technologies or, or whatever it is, right? I think we like to we like to take full advantage of the uh, of the ecosystem effect. But um, yeah, so that's that's that, that's a little bit about us. When you say twenty seven platform investments, what do you mean by platform investments? Does that mean that there you're, you have a majority? You're the majority investor in those. Correct. Yeah, we've taken a control position, right, in those companies. We we own them. We control the board. You know, and and more of like a you know what you think of as like a traditional private equity style investment where we're helping them execute both on a organic and inorganic strategy of, you know, ultimately trying to grow the company three, five, 10 X the size. And, you know, and then, and then, you know, five, you know, five ish years later, trying to exit that investment. And then on your side specifically on that, you know, the aerospace and uh, defense space industry or defense tech, are you looking at things across the whole spectrum, whether they're a venture investment or private equity, or are you mostly focused on the private equity side? So I stay pretty focused on the private equity side. We pull resources across a lot on the venture and the, and the private equity side. I'm, I'm generally more focused on the larger controlling, control-oriented investments. But the interesting thing is, you know, we took two companies public via SPAC a couple of years ago. You know, the, um, you know, the VC worlds have just been slowly colliding with the private equity worlds in that, you know, technology is obviously become a huge factor, even on the defense and government side, right? And they're trying to get a lot more constructive in how they consume technology. And so more and more, it feels like those worlds are, are, are constantly bumping heads. And so, you know, from a, from a, from a, a, a research and, a, and just sort of a thematic perspective, you know, we, we tend to work collaboratively across the firm. But in terms of the deals I lead specifically, I'm, I'm, uh, much more focused on the um, kind of the larger control oriented investments that we do. And, you know, talking about your focus, where, you know, where is your kind of focus day to day? Is it, is it helping the existing companies in the portfolio? Are you sourcing at this stage as, you know, as a partner, where are you spend most of your time? Yeah. And so it's, it's, it's always a little bit of everything. It, it usually comes and goes in waves. So, you know, I'll usually, something will pop up and you'll spend a lot of time with a particular portfolio company. Right. And then, you know, maybe the next week there's, you know, a big origination effort. Maybe you're trying to, you know, work over a founder or on a new vision or a thesis that you have. Right. And so it's, it's a balance of, you know, you're always, always originating. You're always thinking about the next idea. Right. Um, you know, like someone in my position, you know, you're constantly, you're constantly talking with the CEOs of your portfolio companies. Right. It's, it's, whether it's calls, texts, you know, regular check-ins over Zoom, what you know, what have you, you know, you you always have a pulse on your company. So it's a good balance of portfolio management, 
helping those portfolio companies execute on their own strategy and vision through add-on acquisitions, you know, incremental investment, what have you, you know, origin, you know, origination, right. Which is, you know, upfront kind of thesis development, what's going on in the market, always keeping a pulse on that as well as how do you get out there in the market, whether that's, you know, going through, you know, banker led processes or proprietary origination, which is where we tend to spend a lot of our time, right. Getting in front of founders, educating them on who we are, you know, seeing if they're sort of, you know, shared principles and, and values and is there a common vision that we can go execute together? And so it's, it's, and then, uh, and then third, kind of the third leg of that stool is, is, is firm management, right? And just, you know, that's probably, that's a smaller portion of my time, but, um, you know, it's, it, it always tends to be a balance. You're never, you're never pigeonholed into one particular thing for too long. On the investment side, I mean, I'd always imagine it's a lot of looking through companies and, and seeing which ones could make sense to either acquire or make some sort of investment. But it seems like there's a little bit of piece of you've got a thesis. Are there any companies that kind of match your personal the or the firm's thesis and looking through those companies that could make sense? Is, is that the case that you 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 go about it both ways? Yeah, for sure. Particularly on the national security side, I think when you look at a lot of our existing portfolio companies today, like Redwire or Big Bear. Or you know, Firefly or Edge Autonomy, right? I think it, it's it's very it is very thematic driven, right? And it and it usually starts once a quarter. We get together, we discuss the key themes that we're seeing. You know, we try to build build a case around those themes, right? And oftentimes, it's never it, it's never that trivial, right? I mean, you know, a couple of years ago, we were saying, hey, we'd really love to make a play on AI in the government, right? Like, you didn't have to convince anybody that AI was going to be you know, this, this technology trend of the future, right? I mean, that was sort of sitting the obvious that the devil was always really in the details and, you know, how do you play that from a private equity perspective, right? And so it really, what, what ultimately ends up happening is you sort of, you, you kind of pick your spots, right? Thematically, you sort of orient that around the world that you live in, and then you sort of track that technology because there's inevitably a life cycle that these, that they go through, right? Whether they're kind of, you know, still, early on, you know, or maybe more in kind of the earlier stage VC life cycles, right? And there's always kind of the hype phase in the VC cycle, right? And you're, you know, but there's not enough companies of scale where you can really go, you know, buy a couple at reasonable values and integrate them into this bigger platform, right? And so you got to, there's a little bit of patience that's always required in the sense that you got to wait for the timing where it actually makes sense to invest in it from a private equity perspective. And I think that's what AE's done really, really well is, is finding the right themes and thinking about the right way to play it, right? We think about like a red wire, right? There's a lot of different flavors of space companies that we've seen, particularly they go public, right? But for us, you know, I think the way we approached it was, hey, we wanted to have, you know, maybe a more diversified space company, you know, they were, it, you know, that was integrating elements of maybe, you know, kind of legacy space with the new space economy. But, you know, we didn't want, and, and this is kind of a common theme for a lot of private equity firms is when, when we look at these kind of more forward leaning tech plays, right? We don't, we try to hedge as much of the binary risk as we can, right? Private equity firms generally don't like the, the binary risk as much as, 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 as VC firms might. And so for us, it's like, hey, how, how, how can the market get to a spot where we can still hedge our downside, you know, but retain, retain all the benefits that are, you know, making this really attractive sort of tech enabled platform, um, you know, a plausible platform investment where we can string a few together and then ultimately sell it to like a much larger strategic. And so, for us, it almost becomes more timing than it does the actual like development of the of the thesis originally. Interesting. Whether the industry is mature enough for a company like this, or obviously that the company itself is the right, yeah, exactly. yeah, the time for that. Well, because you mentioned uh, Redwire and, and Big Bear uh, dot AI, you were on their board before uh, the IPO through a SPAC, and I think you continue to sit on Big Bear's uh, board. Correct. That's right. Yep. Can you talk about that process and why the team ultimately decided to go public, especially through a SPAC, which obviously there was a, a SPAC craze, but just kind of walk us through that, that, that thought process of why that made sense at that time. Yeah, no doubt. And, you know, I could, I could talk for a long time on the SPAC craze, right? I think it'll, <laughs> it'll make for an interesting case study in someone's, um, you know, business school uh, textbooks one day in terms it, of just everything that went back. down. It, it make <laughs> yeah, it come back. Exactly. Um, yeah. So, you know, for us, it was it was a couple of things. Right. When you looked at like Redwire. Right. And I'm not going to say I don't think every space company that went public should have went public. Right. And that's probably an obvious statement today when you look how some of them have performed. Right. I think what you had was, you know, you had a lot of companies that were too early stage, in my opinion, to go public. Right. I understand the allure. People, everybody wants to go public. Right. There's this allure of going public that I think um, entices a lot of people 
uh, to that, right? But I think what you ended up having was a lot of companies that were, you know, either not very profitable or didn't have a ton of scale, right? And they were sort of in this mind, and the market got so hot, they, they got in this mindset of like, well, you know, should I just go raise another Series C or should I go public, right? Which in hindsight is kind of a crazy question to be contemplating, yeah. right? A lot of these companies didn't have scale, you know, they were burning cash, you know, that sort that whole sort of, you know, going concern thing was, was, you know, uh, a problem. But, you know, when we looked at Redwire, it was a couple hundred million of revenue, very diversified, right? It didn't have some of those kind of, again, those binary risks. So those kind of critical points of failure that some of these other nichier plays that went public had. And, you know, what we saw was a great opportunity to capitalize on Redwire's success, right? As, um, you know, not only sort of a diversified space infrastructure play, but, you know, as a roll up, so to speak, right? You, you, you know, we were, we were acquiring a lot of companies. We had built this platform. We thought there was a lot more acquisition we could go do. And we really wanted to accelerate, you know, Redwire's brand and reputation, which, which going public obviously always helps. And so we had a lot more comfort in taking it public. Obviously, it, it, you know, the economics made a ton of sense, um, which that, that side of the equation always has to check out. But for us, you know, we, we didn't have to worry about a lot of other things that I think other space companies did because we knew we had a real company of scale, you know, diversified. We always told folks like if space wins, Redwire wins, just because of the way that they approach the market, whether they're providing components or subsystems or what have you across large exquisite platforms or, you know, smaller, you know, new space type of type of applications, right? It wasn't it wasn't beholden to any one particular trend that you were seeing in space. And we knew the longer term trends for, sp for space were were great. And so um, and same can be said for Big Bear, right? Big Bear was, again, a couple hundred million of, of revenue. You know, a lot of their a lot of their competitors were public, right? Like the Palantirs of the world, right? And, you know, we just saw an opportunity to really capitalize on, you know, the ability to, um, you know, help step their game up, put them in a public light, you know, and really allow, you know, give them the tools um, to really grow, you know, as quickly as they could, right? Because at the end of the day, private, you know, being a, a private equity platform has its own constraints, right? Because generally we're using leverage to buy these companies. So there's debt, there's covenants, you know, you can't just go, you know, invest an infinite amount of dollars into R&D, right? But being public more than anything enabled those two companies to kind of take some of those natural, um, some of those natural parameters that you live with as a private equity platform off and allow them to really, you know, go after these, these really ambitious visions of being the best, you know, space and AI companies in the market. Yeah. I mean, you said it well earlier. I mean, everyone wants to go public, but you know, how many people, how many people actually want to be public, right? Because it comes with a lot of scrutiny uh, and quarterly reports, but you know, some of that, that discipline is really healthy, right? Making sure that companies are actually taking a step back and thinking about, are we going in the right direction and do the numbers you know, promote that from your experience, when these two companies went public, how much did they change internally? Did you see a big operational switch? Or was it, let's just keep moving forward? Yeah, no, it's a, it's a great question. I think it, things definitely change, right? I think, you know, there, you know, as, as somebody who spends most of his times on private boards, you know, getting used to a public board certainly was a bit of an adjustment, right? There's definitely a lot more administrative stuff you have to deal with, a lot more governance stuff you have to deal with. You now have kind of this whole notion of quarterly earnings, you know, you got equity research, you know, there's a lot more sort of liability management that needs to take place. So, you know, particularly at the board level, things, uh, things changed a lot, right? Um, and then from the company's perspective now, right, I mean, they're the, you know, the goalposts start to change a little bit, right, as being a public company, right? Because again, you have those quarterly earnings, you know, you have this sort of stock price that everybody can see, right? Um, you know, so it definitely, it, it, it definitely changes. And more than anything, you know, you also have to optimize the management teams to be a public company, right? You know, being a public company is a different beast, right? The every, you know, how you structure an organization, how you compensate an organization, right? That, that changes generally, right? Because now you have this sort of public security that you can now use as a tool to incentivize your employees. And so, yeah, I mean, it, 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 it changes, uh, it changes, a, um, a good deal, right? And, that's why I think it's not, you know, it's not necessarily for everybody. You know, I think the benefit of going public, you know, 20 years ago, I think is very different than the benefit today, right? I think the benefit, you know, maybe historically was, you know, quicker access to the to the capital markets. You could raise money, you could do all this sort of stuff. But the reality is, is, is you know, the private markets now, there's no shortage of, of you know, 
you know, liquidity options or ability to raise money or so, you know, you, you don't you don't need to go public for that for that very reason. Right. And there is a lot of cost from an infrastructure standpoint to be to being public. And so I think firms just need to be like fully cognizant that like it's a ton of investment, you know, on the infrastructure side. You know, organizations do change. Right. And I think you, you just you want to have a lot of conviction in your ability to continue to grow, you know, continue to grow profitably, you know, execute the vision, you know, hit your numbers. Right. You know, the streak, it's super, super, you know, keyed in on your ability to forecast and hit your numbers. And so, yeah, it's 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 been a big change. I think ultimately it's, you know, for Redwire and Big Bear, it was it was the right move uh, for them. But I, I don't think it's the right move for everybody. And I think the more I get sort of ingrained in, you know, in, in these, you know, in our public companies that we that we uh, own, um, you know, I think that, you know, the 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 more my, my you know, my, my thoughts evolve as it relates to like, at what size does it make sense for companies to go public or not? Yeah. And I, I think space is interesting in that realm because, you know, I've had this debate with a few C-level uh, folks at space companies where, the question of like some of the companies you mentioned, you know, that have not done well. I think there's a couple uh, most recently where they've been taken private, right, um, through private equity firms that just felt like they they needed to go back to being private and kind of rebuild. Uh, maybe they go back public eventually, but you know, the debate was: Does it make sense for a lot of space companies to be public companies, given that they are focused on things so far out? And some of that revenue, unfortunately, because of that, is probably further out than maybe a typical software play. So. How do you look at that of thinking, does, spa does space and, you know, defense tech have a big, you know, does it have a big future being public companies? Or do you think private equity, private equity is going to actually fill that hole in the future and keep these companies private for longer? And then maybe they sell to another private equity firm. Right. Yeah, look, I think, <clears throat> you know, there's a couple of different tracks that companies run, right? You could have like an Andrel, right? Where like you kind of stay in that VC life cycle, but then you get to a size where you're so big that going public is, is quite frankly your only option because, you know, so it's going to be tough for someone to pay 15 or $20, $20 billion to, to, to buy Andrel. And I'm sure their value expectations are even north of that. But um, I, I think it's circumstantial. I think if you're a space company, you know, and you have, you know, a, a mature platform, right? And a mature infrastructure, and you have sort of an ability to accurately forecast your business, right? I think the challenge was is you had these businesses that were really selling a two or three or four year forward number, right? Through these sort of SPAC, you know, marketing loopholes that you had, right? Because in traditional IPOs, you can't really show projections, right? That was yeah. sort of a unique nature of the SPAC, right? They Which could, is all you they do could say, venture, oh, well, right? We're, yeah, we're 10 million of revenue today, but we're going to be a billion in three years, right? You can't do that through traditional IPOs. And so I think that, you know, I think that sort of created some, you know, some interesting sort of dynamics uh, in in the public markets. But I think, like, if you are, but you're, a, you're a, saying though, in spa in SPACs, you can actually give some projections more than a you potentially could, yes. you know, IPOs. Yeah, that's so what that SPACs was. You need. That was some of the danger in SPACs is you're going off of projections, not real numbers again. Well, that's right. Yeah, because you're going out to retail investors or, or whoever, right? And and you're saying, hey, here's here's our five-year projection, right? And, and like in the case of space companies, it was like, you know, everybody was just showing just astronomical growth, right? And you had a lot of these companies that were getting, you know, people were orienting around value multiples that were two, three, two or three years out, right? And so I think those types of plays where you have companies that, that aren't platforms of scale today, right? And can't accurately forecast where they're going to be 12 months from now and 12 months from now, if that value doesn't necessarily make sense with the broader market, Right. Because what you've seen since that SPAC bubble has popped is values have certainly normalized. Right. When you just look at, you know, revenue multiples, EBITDA multiples, there was a huge normalization from, you know, where space companies were to where, you know, where you're seeing some other defense tech, you know, those sorts of, you know, those sorts of, of comps where they trade today. And so I think, look, if you're you, there are certainly space companies that could definitely go public. Right. And I think it, it could it could benefit them. You know, I just think and I think the market's a lot more a lot more sensitive to this now too, though, is, is, you know, some of those earlier space backs that, you know, that struggled out of the gate because it, there was, you know, a lot of binary risk or they hadn't really, you know, their crazy forecasted materialize or what have you, right? I think those, those companies absolutely benefit from staying private longer. You know, you can, you can, you, you don't have to worry about, you know, near term incentives with quarterly projections and investing all this stuff in your infrastructure just yet. You, you have a lot more flexibility, and a lot less pressure 
um, to just focus on the long-term strategic execution of the business. And so I think it's, it's a balance, but I think, look, you're starting at, you know, you see this a lot in, in, in a lot of different cycles, but you know, you kind of had, you know, space, you kind of had the big bubble, right. You're coming off sort of the SPAC, sort of the SPAC bubble popping, right. You're getting some consolidation in the market. You're seeing who the winners and losers are, right. But space is still hyper important, right. And it's going to continue to be a huge driver of growth. Companies are still really focused on it. And, you know, now you're just, you know, you're going to, you're going to start seeing, um, you know, I think a, a less crazy valuations uh, in the public markets, just given investors are always going to have that in the back of their mind. But um, I absolutely think that there's, there's, there's a, a real market and I think for, for space companies to go public. And I think it's going to continue to grow. It's just, I don't think you'll see what you saw with sort of the SPAC mania ever. Again. It's, interesting. It, it's interesting. Yeah. It seems like the, the key for a company to go public of a space company is do they have quote unquote predictable revenue that they can look to that's diversified enough that someone can look at that and be like, I think this company, you know, this is real revenue and we'll grow at you know X rate. And I can actually put a valuation on this versus what was happening. People had no idea how to value these companies because the revenue was not mature enough and predictable enough. That's exactly right. Yeah. A hundred percent. Well, we've we've uh we've had the fortune of having quite a few different VCs on um, who are investing obviously a much you know um, earlier stage uh, than you are, and so they're looking at these companies with just projections, with just the team, sometimes even just the team, right? It's an idea on a napkin at times if they're investing seed, pre seed, and they don't have any revenue to go off of. But on your end, you're you're investing you know, predominantly later stage, and you actually do have some numbers to go off of. What are you, what's kind of the lens and the thesis that you're looking through? What are the most important things that you're looking for when you're looking at an investment on the PE side? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, look, I think management is always ex extremely important to us, right? Yeah, at the end of the day, you're, you're, you're generally underwriting a management team, whether that's because you have maybe some folks on the sideline that you're going to put into this investment. You know, we tend to do more of, we want to underwrite kind of the management teams that are running that company today. Right. So when we're looking at new opportunities, we're, we're evaluating that management team. So like similar to VC, right. The, you know, we, we, you know, the best investments for us are ones where we have a management team that like we're, we're super confident in, you know, there's a strong relationship, there's a strong rapport. Right. But at the end of the day, you know, where private equity, you know, probably differs from VC is that we need to feel comfortable that that business, you know, isn't going to disappear because, you know, the management team, you know, for whatever reason isn't there, right? So there needs to be some sort of enduring, you know, enduring nature to whether that's the capabilities, the missions that they serve, the technology, what have you, right? We tend to get more focused on um, hedging our downside risk, right? You know, because you, 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 I'm sure you talked to a lot of VC firms, right? And the way they operate is different than us, right? They're going to, they want to write a larger, you know, they want to, they want to invest in more companies. They're generally smaller checks. Your winners, you know, really have huge outsized returns. You may take a couple of zeros. You may have a couple of okay ones, right? But it might be like two or three companies that really out of your 20 that drive, you know, all the, the returns, returns in, that, in, yeah. that, in that VC fund. Yeah, exactly. I mean, you're, 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 you know, you want the unicorns. Whereas, you know, in private equity, we, we prefer a much more stable, like zeros hurt for private equity firms, right? And so we don't, you know, we spend a lot more time thinking about how to, you never want a zero, quite frankly, because we're, you know, we're taking a more concentrated position, you know, instead of 20 or 30 companies in a fund, we want to buy eight or 10 and taking a much more concentrated position. And so for us, we spend a lot more time on, on, you know, downside mitigation, right. And, you know, we, you know, we don't necessarily need to have a, a 10 or 20 times, you know, MOIC or return on our invested capital, right? I think we we generally want to go have a bunch of three to four X returns, right? Where the downside is 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 relatively limited and we don't have to worry about these binary risks that could wipe our investment out. And so, you know, for us management teams obviously very critical, but there there has to be, you know, some sort of differentiating element to the business that helps protect the downside, whether that's through you know, IP, right, or capabilities or customer access, right? But we need to, you know, there, there needs to have some comfort that, you know, these, the, the, these are enduring businesses. But on the flip side, you know, for us, it's, it's, it's always, where can we pour gasoline on the fire, right? Because as a private equity firm, we're very focused on our, our particular markets, right? We just don't want to provide capital. We tell people that all the time. Like, if you just need money, we're not the right partners for you. We want to find folks that want to go, you know, aggressively execute, you know, a vision or a strategy. And what we always tell folks is, you know, take your seven to 10 year 
plan and we'll help you get that done in three to four years, right? We'll really compress the time frame that you can execute on that vision, right? And, and we can really pour gasoline on the fire, so to speak. So we want to find companies with really good momentum. You know, they're disrupting some sort of market, right? But still have some, you know, element of, of maturity and, um, you know, you know, some recurring element to their to their business such that, you know, we can use that to go bolt on other companies, invest in and really build on top of it and not have to worry about, you know, the rug getting pulled out from underneath you. Yeah. It's interesting. And you, you mentioned like you, that management team may not be there forever. And I think Buffett talks about that. Obviously Buffett's big on the management team, but he finds, he tried, I think he says something along the lines of like, I try to find businesses where an idiot could run it. Right. Because it's just right. such a good business because yeah. you never know who's going to run the business at the end of the day, a few years right. down the road. Uh, I do want to talk because you, you know, you're talking about how do you take a seven, 10 year vision and then do that in one to three years? What are the things that I don't know how much you can share on this, but that your team really tries to do that? Like what's, you know, you don't have to give all the inside playbook, but like what's kind of the general framework to do that? Yeah, absolutely. So for us, you know, I'll, I'll focus on the national security side for a bit. Right. But for, you know, when we're looking at some of our, you know, defense and space companies, right. It, at the end of the day, you know, they're predominantly working with the government, right? They're bidding on government programs and contracts, right? And so, you know, the the best playbook that 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 we like to run is how you know how you know it starts with a story and a vision, right? Like what's what's the problem and how are we gonna go solve that problem, right? Everything sort of starts with a problem, right? What's the pain point? You know, what needs to happen? What you know, where is the government behind? You know, what technology do they not have yet, right? So it always starts with a problem, and that's and that's where we sort of architect a, a story and a vision around. But at the end of the day, it's how do we go bring a collection of assets together, right? You always hear sort of the phrase like one plus one equals five, right? But like, how do we bring a collection of companies together where we can effectively integrate those those companies and those capabilities to position themselves to bid on much larger programs, right? Because the way the way the government works, right, is is you know it's not it's not like it's not like war dogs, right? Like the you know you're not going to see billion dollar programs get awarded to you know twenty million dollar revenue companies. It just it, the reality is it just doesn't happen, right? The government there's 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 an element of scale that's required to bid on big government programs, right? And so you need that that muscle mass, right? You need that 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 connective tissue, and so. What we like to do is, is we like to go bring, you know, a, two, three, four companies together. They may have their own respective capabilities, but when you bring them together, you get the benefit of past performance of all their capabilities, all their customers. You give them that platform of scale, you know, you build a mature infrastructure and now you can, now you can go to the customer and shape the requirements for future programs, right? And so a lot of times for us, what it is, is we're picking a spot, right? It's usually a tech, not, you know, it's usually around some technology trend, right? Call it AI, right? So we're going to say, okay, here's what's going on in the AI landscape. You know, we know the government needs it, right? But they don't necessarily know what they want yet, right? And that happens. The government is very incompetent. Is I don't think anybody will 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 debate. But you know, whether that's autonomy or space or AI, right? So in this instance, we're like, okay, we know the government says they need more AI, but they don't really know what they need, right? And they're so disorganized and they're so massive. You know, the the what, the playbook is how do you build enough critical mass and enough capabilities where now you have a legitimate platform of scale and then you can leverage your network inside the government to then go shape those requirements and tell the government what they need. And now you're building the programs for them, right? In terms of the, you're helping them define the requirements, you're help, you're, you're showing them what can be done. And then on the back end, you're getting the large program, right? And that obviously takes a lot of time. The government has a very long sales cycle, but like the general playbook on the national security side is, you know, Bring these capabilities together so that such that you you have enough muscle mass to throw around, and then you go to the government and you tell them what they need. You shape those requirements. You 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 shape those programs of record for them because when when you can demonstrate an integrated platform that now has a program of record under its belt, that's where you just get a a, a huge uplift in in enterprise value. So instead of just responding to RFPs from the government, you're create you're almost creating the RFP, right? Without even having a formal RFP, you're you're showing them here's what you guys need, and here's how we could create it for you. Hundred percent, yeah. I mean, like you you're, you're always going to have a traditional, you know, capture and bid proposal team, and, and you're going to be bidding on stuff. But the reality is, most companies, you know, it's a ten to twenty percent win rate, right? And there's a lot of resources required. So if your entire business model is centered on nothing but responding to RFPs, you're inevitably already behind the curve. Right. And so for us, you know, it's always, you know, 
what is a strategic priority for the government, right? And how do we help solve those problems that they're experiencing by, you know, creating these, creating these platforms and helping shape these programs for them and sort of letting them hit the easy button, right? So that they know, you know, they know what they're getting, they know how to do it, you know, and so that's, that's been a, a very common playbook for us. So give us a little bit of insight of kind of that relationship between you and the management team, because you know, you're obviously in order to make that investment, you're saying we're not just capital. Like if that's, if you just need capital, we're not the right partners, but if you need someone to help you, you know, scale quickly and, and hit that vision sooner, that's us. So once you've made that investment, what's that partnership look like? How much, you know, how much is it you sitting down with the teams, you doing the research? What does that look like? Yeah, I would say that, um, you know, on the CEO front, you know, we don't, we don't want to tell people how to run their companies, right? So we're, that, that's never our business. And we always tell them, like, if we are running your company, that's because something, something went wrong, right? We're, yeah. we're investors. We want to help, help them shape and define, you know, the strategic path, help them manage the capital structure, you know, help them, you know, if they ever have any problems and they need a couple extra smart folks at the table to bounce ideas off of, right? Like, you know, and then we obviously, you know, are very heavily involved at the board level. But like in, in terms of the day to day, that's never our intention. We don't want to we don't want to be running businesses, right? We want to be putting really qualified people in place, you know, to let and, and letting them do their job, quite frankly. And so, you know, we have a very collaborative we like to we have a very collaborative relationship with 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 our leadership team. And it all starts with the CEO, right? You know, the CFO is a little bit more of a unique position, particularly in private equity platforms, given given sort of the parameters of being a private equity platform, you usually have an institutional lender, covenants, you know, you're usually doing a lot of M&A, right? So you know, how you manage the cap, the cap, the cap structure is a lot more involved maybe than like a, like a VC investment. You know, the CFO is always a very unique position within private equity platforms. And they usually almost act as a liaison to some degree between the private equity firm and the portfolio company, just given some of the additional requirements of being a private equity platform. But at the CEO level, you know, it's, 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 um, there's constant communication, constant line of communication, but it's never like, Hey, I, you need to send me this report every day, you know, blah, blah, blah. It's, it's more of like, Hey, how can we be partners? You know, I'll roll up my sleeves if you need me to roll up my sleeves, but if you're crushing it and you want us to get out of the way, I'm happy to run a down and out. Right. And, and not get in anybody's way. Like I'm fine. I'm fine to just block or do whatever you need me to do. So, yeah. you know, for us, you know, the team is, is critically important in, in you know, what you, you know, the quote you referenced from, from Buffett is, is, is interesting and it's very true, right? It's in, in the way we almost think about it from a private equity perspective is, um, you know, really good CEOs, you know, what they do really well is they just build teams underneath them, right? And it's almost like, and, and they delegate really effectively. I think a common pitfall that we see in CEOs is they try to do everything themselves. Everything, everything has to go through them. They're the critical point of failure. Every decision goes through them. The team they build underneath them is almost, they're almost enablers. You know, they're not so much, you know, they're, they're not, you know, challenging the CEO or, or, you know, trying to, you know, push the company forward or, you know, kind of run through walls, whatever it is. They're just sort of underneath the CEO. You know, some of the best CEOs we've ever had, you know, they could leave, they could, they could leave for a couple of weeks. They could go on vacation for a month and the business is still performing really well. Right. And I think that, that so really good CEOs build really great teams underneath them. And they're really good at, you know, assessing talent both ways. They can sniff out BS just as well as they can find a winner, right? And they know how to empower those individuals, you know, to meet their potential. They know how to retain those individuals. They know how to maintain the culture and, and you know, in terms of, you know, there's always gonna be a story, there's always gonna be a vision. And it's the CEO's job to really sort of evangelize that throughout the organization and, and make sure everybody's bought in, right? It's like a system, right? And keep everybody bought in. And so good CEOs build great teams. And, and you can always tell on a private equity platform because it's almost like a conductor, right? It frees them up. They can do more strategic things. But, you know, if you have day-to-day -day decisions that are sort of, you know, falling on a CEO or they're getting caught up with this or that, you know, they're, they're you know, they're not at a, either they're smaller and, and they could benefit from more scale and a bigger team, or they're just not, structuring their organization right, you know, to, to scale longer term, because it's impossible to scale if your CEOs aren't freed up to focus on like really, really strategic items. Yeah. And that's what changes, right? And the, obviously the early stage CEOs are focused on a thousand different things and they have to force themselves out of the business to work on the business, which is a great thing about a board early on is it, it forces you to do that, even if it's not a public board, but as you know, 
the, the CEOs that you're probably working with predominantly, I mean, they should, I don't know what the percentage of, is of that they should be focused on the business, not in the business, right? And how much of their time should be thinking about strategy since they have all the right people in the place or in the right place. So that, I, I assume that's what you you see the most is like the best, tell me if that's right. The best CEOs are a majority of the time is like strategy at that stage. For sure. Yeah. I mean, you know, they're, 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 they're building the vision. They're keeping everybody, you know, on that path, you know, they're focused on the strategy kind of, you know, I think, um, what was it? Bezos. I think it was Bezos. He said, like, you know, I try to make three really good decisions every day. You know what I mean? Yeah. Like three high quality decisions. And that's sort of, you know, that kind of perfectly illustrates like our CEOs, right? Like if they're making a thousand decisions a day, like, you know, they're, you know, they have to, you know, babysit or they're dealing with HR issues constantly, right? Like they're just not, that's not where you want your CEOs to be. You want them to be in a position where they can make a small number of very meaningful decisions. Yeah. The, 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 the decisions that they are making should make a, a big impact where again, earlier on, they're probably make they have, just have to make a thousand decisions. And probably it's hard to tell which ones are going to have a real a exactly. impact. That's right. What about the, uh, not everything goes right. So what about the executives? You're like, that, that's the, the shining you know, CEO, the great example. I'm sure you've dealt with some that we won't mention any names um, or we'll bleep them out that you've seen. You're like, <laughs> if I could give a playbook of those, that's what you don't do. What are some of those things that, you know, as a CEO or just a leader in the organization that you see, you got to avoid those mistakes? Yeah, I think it's, it's, um, it's a couple of things, right? I think not, I mean, culture, it, 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 culture is always the biggest, right? And you could always tell when something is not going well, because the culture is inevitably broken, right? You usually see it ahead of time, you know, whether that's retention numbers or what have you, right? But it's, it's, it, if they're not doing a good job, you know, building the culture, and sometimes that comes down to the teams that they build underneath them, they're making bad hires, they're not willing to make tough decisions to course correct. Right. And I would say that's honestly, that's probably the most common um, critical failure with CEOs is they're either slow or unwilling to make tough decisions. Right. And I think that that is what separates um, good CEOs from bad CEOs. Right. You know, you may have somebody they're not performing well, you know, and you don't put in the proper plan to either course correct, have accountability, you know, or make a change, right? And it's hard. I mean, it's not easy, right? Being a CEO is, is really hard, but that's ultimately, you know, you're you're getting paid to make tough decisions. And so oftentimes it comes down to culture and just, you know, the culture is broken for whatever reason, you know, they're unable to sort of bring everybody into the boat, so to speak. Um, and they're just not willing to make tough decisions, right? To make sure that the business is healthy and sustainable and on the right trajectory. Yeah, that's great. They reminded of another quote kind of on the long, along the lines of, you know, the the most successful people probably have the most hard conversations on a yes. daily basis as they're growing their companies. And they're just it's hard. willing to do it. We run into a lot of, um, we do a lot of founder-owned transactions. And of course, every time we're partnering with these founders, they're like, oh, you know, maybe they're a hundred million of revenue today. Or they're like, oh, I want to be, a billion dollars of revenue. I want to be the CEO and I want to do this and that. And, and we always sort of preface it with them. We're like, Hey, listen, like you're going to get to a size where being the CEO isn't, isn't what you necessarily think it is. Right. It's a very, you know, being the CEO of a small growing entrepreneurial company is very different. You know, once you get to that sort of $500 million revenue size, right. Being a CEO is it's very, very different and it's very challenging. Right. Cause again, to your point, you, you know, you have to make a lot of tough decisions and it's not always sort of like, Hey, you're now the tip of the spear customer conversations involved in growth. It's much more, you know, it's much more, um, inward looking, right. And you're focused on, on the people that are directly underneath you. And, you know, you, you, you got to keep, keep things steady and keep folks happy and, um, you know, sometimes make tough decisions. So it's a, it's a tough job. Yeah. Some of the, the founders I've really appreciated over the years are the ones that have been really honest with themselves. They've said, I was a great CEO when we were, you know, one to 100 or 150. And then yeah. I wasn't the right person for the job after that. Yeah. Like I'm not the best manager. Like I, I got to go bring in someone else who is. And 
yeah, I'll lose the CEO title, but the company is going to go on and succeed because we were doing everything else right. But this is, this is not what I should be doing. And I, and I'm, and I'm drowning. <laughs> we love those. You know, and those are the situations we look for and the way, I mean, and two, typically founders are rolling heavily into our transactions. And so, you know, they're incentivized the same way we are. We don't ever like any misalignment of incentives. And so it's, you know, for them, they want the best outcome for the business and them economically, obviously. And so that's always a great way to ensure that like, you know, you're keeping them honest, but agree. We, we like the low ego, do we call it best athlete, right? Best athlete approach for everything we do. Yeah. Leo Messi is pretty humble for a guy who's the best in the world. Right. So, right. No doubt. Uh, well, let, let, as we, you know, start to wrap, I definitely want to talk a little bit about your career. You know, again, the humility piece is important. So I'll brag on you a little bit. You know, you're at a partner at, you know, the, one of the PE firms that's like at the center of what's going on and, you know, aerospace and defense and just a lot of amazing things. What do you think, you know, you talked a little bit about being scrappy. What is it that got you there, right? Because success is, is not an accident, right? We can, we obviously get lucky along the way. Um, but for those who are most successful, luck plays a part, but it's still not an accident. What would you put it down to? If I had to put it down to one thing, I, I do, I always go back to my days as a student athlete in college. I think, you know, I'm, I, I'm a miserably competitive person, but that's, I wouldn't say that's what's going to necessarily equate to success. I think it's what it was, was is it was a function of not just that, but being able to function in a team environment, like being a team player, right? You have to have that sort of competitive edge. You have to have that desire to, to never fail. But at the same time, you have to know how to operate as a team, right? You need to know how to trust other people. You need to know how to build, tr you know, let people, you know, build trust in you. You need to know how to pay your dues and right. And so it's, it's, you know, it's always a tough balance, right? Cause when I think back to college basketball, it's like, you know, you loved your teammates, right? But every day your coach was trying to recruit the best players possible. Those players coming in every year wanted to take your spot, right? You had to fight for your spot every single day. Right. And it was constant competition, but at the end of the day, those were your brothers. Right. And, and there had to be camaraderie, right? And so it's, uh, you know, I think compet I think competitive tension is is always excellent for any organization, but it has to be done in a collaborative, um, in cooperative way where people respect one another. And I think that's what like, I think that's what always really helped me. You know, I was I, I was I was definitely always kind of a scrappy, gritty kind of person, hated to lose. You know. Um, but at the end of the day, like understanding what it means to be a team and like what it means to build like this whole notion of a system, right? The best basketball programs, they were systems, right? Yeah. You know, a, a, someone comes in, they get developed, they leave, right? But, and they turned into a great player or what have you. And so I think, you know, be, you know, thinking back to my time as a student athlete that what, you know, and just everything I went through as a basketball player, right? From a bench player to sixth man the next year. Then I was starting the next year and then I was the captain and the leading scorer the final year, right? Kind of went through the whole gamut of experiences, right? That's, you know, I paid my dues, had to start from the bottom, work my way up, you know, but had to always be a good teammate first and foremost. I think that's, that's what really helped me out. Yeah. I mean, in the sports analogy, you know, in football, like you're not always going to be the one that's going to make the, the catch for the, you know, the winning touchdown every time, like sometimes you got to let someone else do that. And sometimes you're not the right person for that play and someone else has got to catch it. I think that's what's hard being an athlete and what's hard in business sometimes. And like being part of a great team is, is making sure that the team wins first and foremost. Um, and yeah, and I, and I feel, and I feel lucky too. I mean, AE is a, I joined AE cause I really liked the people and I, and I, and I was bought into the vision and you know, that I would say that was probably the luck part of it for me was that I landed at a firm that, you know, has an outstanding culture, great people, you know, it was, it was a firm where you could build a real team environment. Right. And so, you know, I would say if that, you know, that was, that was the lucky part of my career was, was finding these guys and, and, and being able to join them. On that note, what, what has been maybe the best piece of advice that you've received from, you know, people within the firm, mentors outside, if, if there was one piece of advice that you, th you always look back at, that was incredibly helpful. Yeah, it's funny. It's, um, you know, I go back to back when I was playing college again, it's funny. It's like, I, I've obviously gotten a lot of advice, right. And, and there's no shortage of sort of like, you know, one liners that, you know, sort of keep people focused. But I think like when I was in, co when I was in college, the first day of practice every single year, 
our coach would write on a piece of paper that he would get that he would give to everybody and he would say a journey of a thousand miles begins with the first step right and he would say that every single year and it always stuck with me because the you know the the point was always like no matter what journey you're on no matter how ambitious whatever you want to do the you know the first step is you just got to do something you just got to take that first step right and i think a lot of folks get hung up on like hey, maybe this is too ambitious, this is too big of a jump, or people get frustrated with how slowly they're moving, right? But at the end of the day, success success comes slowly and methodically, right? And just like taking that first step and just trying to get a little bit better every single day was always like, you know, was always where I, you know, and, and sometimes that requires patience, a frustrating amount of patience. But like you have to sort of, you have to kind of buy in, right, to, to the path that you put yourself on. And so I've always, I've always remembered that quote. Right. It's just a journey of a thousand miles begins with the first step. Yeah. And the, the consistency of those steps that never friend is in uh, private equity. Coincidentally, he, he always shared like, you know, when he was a wrestler, these guys, he, he'd crush these other guys because they were, when they would did a workout, like they were, you know, his, you know, competitors, sometimes they were, they would go, you know, 120%, but then they'd miss another day. And then another day they would go you know, do another 120%, then he miss. He's like, I was just consistent. Like I never, you know, outdid them on the, you know, workout or anything. I was just every day I didn't miss. He's like, the consistency has been the biggest thing for me. Slow and steady wins the race. So true. All right. What about a favorite book? Is there a favorite book that's helped you the most? So that's, so, so I would say the book that, that helped me the most, I read a lot of books. So my favorite books are, I, I'm a big sci-fi guy. So I read a lot of like, kind of like nerdy sci-fi books, but um, my favorite book that probably helped me the most was a book called Atomic Habits, if you've ever heard of it. Yeah, yeah, James Clear. James Clear, um, yeah. And it, it's it kind of goes back to what we were just talking about. I mean, the whole punchline is like the aggregation of marginal gains, right? Just get one percent better every single day, right? And it's just how do you build like those habits where you know it becomes part of your lifestyle, right? It's not just you know some sort of fad or whatever. But that that book had a lot of really really interesting tactics to like really, uh, you know, finalize and, you know, institutionalize uh, good habits that you wanted to keep and bad habits that you wanted to, you wanted to get rid of. So recently that's a book, that's a book that I've, uh, I've really liked. I also uh, recently read uh, uh, Shoe Dog by Phil, uh, Phil Knight. That was an awesome book. Such a good bike. Yeah. Good book. Didn't that just teach you like how, how it's shocking how many times they almost went out of business for how long they've been around. They're just always almost out of business for 10, 15 years. And I loved it. You know, he was kind of a, you know, he was a student athlete, scrappy, you know, just had this vision, had this passion, followed his passion, you know, never gave up, you know, and um, you know, it was a, it was, a, it was a really awesome book. So I, I, for any kind of person that kind of has a similar background to me, I, I would always tell them they, they should read shoe dog. I love that. Okay. What about, uh, it, you know, if you could leave us with one piece of your own career advice, you kind of hit on a few different pieces of advice, but you know, what would it be? You know, you got to have some element of toughness in whatever you do. Right. And you know, toughness isn't toughness, isn't doing what you want to do. It's just doing what you need to do. Right. And so I think, you know, this whole element of like being kind of gritty and, and resourceful and, you know, it's tough because it's definitely a fleeting characteristic that we're seeing today in people, right? Particularly young people, just this whole, you know, we, we, we're, we're more focused on sort of, you know, checking the box than we are sort of evaluating intangibles, right? But if there's sort of one intangible that I think supersedes all of them in sort of helping to find somebody's success, it's just grit, right? And just teaching yourself to be tough, teaching yourself to never give up, teaching yourself to just figure out a way Right. I think it's, it's such an underappreciated and it's becoming more underappreciated, even in this current environment where again, the intangibles, you know, aren't being as scrutinized as much, as much as they should be. And so for folks, I always just say, you know, attitude and effort can, you know, focus on the things that you can control and, you know, just have, you know, have that grit, that, that desire to never give up and, you know, pave your own, pave your own path. It's why sports are so great, right? I mean, if obviously the percentage of people who actually make a living out of it's so low, but the the things that it teaches you makes you millions, right? There's just 
so many great things sports teach you. And now you're, you're the father of three. So you're probably seeing it now, uh, as a coach of those kids, but it's pretty cool. 100%. I mean, it te teaches you to be super gritty when things are not, it, it really does. In your yeah, face. I mean, and it teaches you humility. You know, it teaches you <laughs> life's not fair, right? I is never able to jump higher, uh, than most of the players on the basketball court. Right. But like, you know, it, it tests your, it tests your, your, your love and your passion for something, right. And how bad do you really want something? And, you know, like they always say, you know, hard work beats talent, you know, any day of the week and how, you know, it's just a function of how bad you want it. And so I, I totally agree. I think there's a lot of, a lot of great things that you can take away from that into the, into the real world. Love that. Well, let's, let's end with that, Jeff. Thanks for taking the time. Really appreciate it. Excited to see what you and the, your, your partners do at AE and, we're going to, I'm sure we're going to be seeing a lot of you and 10 year plans that are going to be in the next three years. So maybe we'll just connect in three years and see what those 10 year plans have been. What you guys completed. Love it. Thanks so much, Matt. Had a blast. Really appreciate it. And uh, looking forward to getting up to uh, Colorado to see you soon. We love that. Thanks, Jeff. All right, buddy. All right, man. Yeah. Bye-bye.